Uh, my name is Nadine, I'm the academic director of APC Learning Schools. We have three schools, two here in Ireland and one in the UK. So I'd like to uh, share with you this morning my experience of communicating change to our teachers, to the teachers in our two Irish schools here at least. Now, um, communication obviously is an essential skill for any manager to have. But I think, you know, uh, your ability to, to communicate well with your staff is really, really put to the test when you are asked to communicate change. Because, <clears throat> well, at the end of the day, nobody really likes change. Um, and in fact, they say the only people who really welcome change are in <laughs> um, so with that in mind, uh, what was the, the big change that I was tasked with communicating? Well, essentially, um, in a nutshell, it was a complete overhaul of our curriculum. Uh, so this entailed designing a new syllabi, a new syllabus at each level for each course type, um, new syllabi at all the plus levels, um, asking teachers to adopt a completely new approach to lesson planning um, and a new approach to classroom-based assessment. So essentially, big, big change, big change in our school, which took place over the course of a year and in fact really is, is still ongoing. So the first thing I did uh, you know, when, when I had made all these changes on paper, was to plan out how I was going to communicate the changes to the teachers. So we had decided to implement two big changes separately. And um, so all our initial communication was focused on the new syllabus and changes to uh, lesson planning. And the idea was that when that was up and running and well established, only then would we begin to communicate with the teachers about uh, the new assessment plan. So, two, two, two separate communications essentially. So, the first thing we did was to sit down and think about what means of communication we had at our disposal. Um, <clears throat> so, the first thing was obviously, I guess, it was meetings, face to face meetings. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Importantly, uh, I had secured a budget in order to pay teachers to come together for an hour or more um, for a number uh, of meetings. What we did was we had some initial meetings where we introduced the changes to the teachers. Then we asked them to go off and implement them and run with them for a while. And then when they had some experience in working with the changes, we then held more meetings, we came back together again and had some feedback meetings where we discussed the success or otherwise uh, of the changes. Um, these meetings, uh, feedback meetings in particular, really proved uh, invaluable to the, the success of the project. The next uh, method of communication open to us was uh, handbooks. Now, granted, it's not the most communicative uh, form of communicating. Um, I think George might say, don't confuse the handbook for communication. Uh, but the handbooks allowed us to convey large amounts of relevant information to our teachers. Information that they would need to access again and again throughout the process. So we had a different approach with the syllabus and with um, assessment. We designed a handbook for the syllabus and a handbook for assessment. With the syllabus, we had the meeting first. We introduced the changes. Then we gave the teachers the handbook and we asked them to go off and implement the changes. With assessment, we gave the teachers the handbook a week or two prior to the meeting in order to allow them to process the huge amount of information we were, we were giving them. And, uh, and then we came together to, to discuss the initial changes we were making to assessment. So this was uh, a more effective way of doing it essentially because it allowed teachers to come to the meetings prepped and ready with questions and it was a more uh, effective use of our, our time together. Um, and then uh, there was training. 
So while the meetings allowed us to communicate the, the, the what and the why of change, it was really in the training sessions where we uh, communicated the, the how. So uh, they allowed us to focus on its, uh, very particular specific aspects of change, um, uh, practical aspects that we wanted teachers to, to, to implement in the classroom. So the idea was that we'd hold training courses every few weeks and that the training courses would be run by the directors of studies. Um, Joanne, the director of studies from our Dublin school, is here today. And Aoife, the director of studies from our Bray school, is currently on her way to pronounce <laughs> 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 um, So, uh, yeah, every few weeks, training sessions, uh, you know, as a leader rose. And um, what actually happened in practice was that those teachers who had um, adapted and, and taken on the change well from the start actually came on board and offered to, to uh, provide training for their colleagues. So I think this uh, was really important for getting more and more teachers on board. It was less top down. Um, when other teachers saw their teachers implement the change and talk about best practice and how to do it um, and how successful it was for them and their students. Um, more people came on board. So that was how to communicate, excuse me. <coughs> the next thing then I sat down and thought about was what to communicate. And it was at this point, you know, that I realised that there was so much more to communicate to the teachers than the mere facts of, of change. Uh, the fact that we were going to change. First and foremost, I, I, I realised that I really needed to be clear with the teachers from the outset, um, you know, as, as George mentioned in his talk, uh, as to why we were changing, um, you know, the, the, the reason and the purpose for changing. So I had, well, we had in, in our academic team in the school, had a, a vision of where we wanted the school to be in a year's time. And this entailed, you know, um, <coughs> a curriculum of the highest quality and uh, offering our students a learning experience of the highest quality and providing our teachers with a, a wonderful space to work where they come in every day and engage in best practice and they be wonderful. So this was, this was the vision and I knew I had to uh, really convey this to them from the outset. Um, Yet there was, there was still more, there was still more to communicate. So what I did was I sat down and I, uh, I made a list and this list turned into two lists. What I wanted and what I needed. So what I wanted to communicate very clearly to the teachers when we did come together for, for our meetings was the following. I, I wanted teachers to be excited, but to be as excited about the change in this project as I, as I, as I was. Now, needless to say, I didn't say that to them. <laughs> but I, I hoped that my enthusiasm for change would come across in my communications with them. And I think I had, I was successful, I had some degree of success with this. Um, and I did this by reiterating uh, keeping this, this vision we had of quality and best practice to the forefront of the discussion at all times. So I kept coming back to it again and again and again. Quality, best practice and the benefits for everybody. I also wanted the teachers to feel involved. I, I realized that this was very important for getting people on board to ensure that they felt involved. So, I wanted them to know that although this felt like a top-down enforcement of change, and I guess in effect it was, um, at the same time the, the, the final product, you know, the, the new syllabus or the new assessment framework, uh, the, the shape of the final product, was uh, open to discussion. Just because it had been written down in paper, it wasn't set in stone. So I wanted them to know that we were going to ask for their input along the way, and that they would have choices along the way. I wanted them to be reassured. I wanted them to know that really, you know, we were going to 
make these changes slowly, one at a time, and that there would be support there for them, and that really they had nothing to fear from change. And then finally, I wanted to be honest about the parameters of change. And what I mean by this is, I wanted teachers to know that although we were going to ask for their input along the way, and we were going to ask for their suggestions and recommendations, at the same time, we were only going to consider their, their suggestions um, within certain parameters. So to give you an example, um, you know, we could come together and discuss the, the, the shape of the, the syllabus, the content, the organization of the syllabus, but the syllabus had to be criterion or had to be um, uh, action oriented. Um, assessment, we could talk about the uh, assessment criteria, the wording of the assessment criteria, the number of assessment criteria, but uh, uh, the assessment has to be criteria of reference. So there were parameters in which teachers' suggestions would be taken. And then what I needed, what I needed to convey to them and what I needed from them. I, I needed change to be made and I needed them to know that change had to happen and not changing was not an option. Uh, I needed them to be open to it. I needed them to try and adapt a positive <coughs> mind frame and to be patient and to understand that change takes time, it doesn't happen overnight, it can be a bumpy road, it won't necessarily be a smooth journey initially. But to be patient and to trust that it's all going to work, <coughs> to stick with us. And then lastly, I needed teachers to just run with it, to just do it, to just go into the classrooms and implement it, and we would take it from there. So this is this is what I think I was relatively successful with getting across to them from the outset, more or less. Uh, and then I sat down and I thought about the challenges uh, that we might face along the way. And uh, this is when I became uh, pretty anxious. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I thought out, I thought about um, the particular aspects of change that teachers might be most resistant to. Um, I wrote them down. I wrote all the things down, and I thought very, very carefully about how I was going to address these concerns when we met. I planned to the point of almost scripting my response. So there were the uh, challenges that you would expect, extra workload, maybe the students won't like it, and what kind of support are we going to get? And I made sure that I was ready with the answers. Um, and it's testament to our teachers, I think, that I actually met less resistance than I had anticipated. For the most part, they did actually just run with it, as I asked. And I am eternally grateful to them for that. Uh, but that's not to say that there was no anxiety about change, that there was. Um, actually, I, I think I failed to anticipate just how anxious some people would be about change. I had assumed that everybody would feel able to implement the changes. Excuse me, I thought they might want to and I thought they might feel a bit disgruntled about being asked to, but I thought they would feel capable and able to do so. But in fact, some people were quite stressed and some people were quite anxious about their ability to cope and their ability to, to do their job properly as, as they had always done so. So, um, in retrospect, while support was there for them, I think this is the one thing that I didn't communicate clearly enough from the outset, just how much support was there for them. Um, I wasn't explicit enough about the type of support that was there, and if I were to go and do this again, I would probably draw up an, a program of support and hand it out to them. So, uh, I could actually talk about this all day because this was such a huge project and it's just, you know, there's so much to say about it, but uh, we have time constraints. So, uh, very quickly, uh, some top tips from my experience of planning and carrying out uh, the communication of this huge change project. 
Um, a lot of these will be self-evident to you guys, but if there is anyone out there um, planning on embarking on, on, on a similar journey, this is what I have to say. I think I have eight tips. So, uh, firstly, face-to-face -face communication is very effective. This is pretty obvious. Um, but do as much of it as you can. Uh, if you don't pay for your teachers to come to meetings normally, try to secure funding so that you can guarantee attendance uh, by everybody there. Um, when you do meet, just make sure that you give your teachers a, a forum for uh, addressing any concerns that they have, expressing concerns and giving you feedback. Um, that you know they have that, that kind of space to communicate with you. It's not all about you communicating to them. Plan your communication well. Uh, you know we can get so caught up in uh, planning the actual change event itself, which I'm guilty of spending so much time on planning this actual change that you don't necessarily leave enough time to planning your communication of this change. And really, you know, without effective communication, there's a chance, a higher chance at least, that the change will, will fail. Be very clear about your objectives, as George said. You know, be very clear that you uh, convey or communicate to your teachers why you are, why you are planning these changes, for what purpose. And, uh, you know, Needless to say, like in the classroom, make sure that these objectives are, um, you know, achievable, realistic, and achievable. Um, otherwise, they probably won't be taken seriously by your teachers. Uh, make sure your stakeholders feel involved. There are many different stakeholders in this project that we did for the purpose of this talk. I'm just focusing on the teachers. Um, do all you can to make sure that, that they are involved and they feel involved. So, if you can, uh, give them some ownership of the the change process or the, the final change product and communicate this to them from the outset how they will be in, involved. Uh, that said, set your parameters and be very clear about what you and they can and cannot do. And I think this is important because I think if you don't do this at the very start and you invite their, their opinions and their suggestions and they give you suggestions and you start to decline them because they don't fit in with your image in your head of how things should be, uh, then they'll, they'll start to become despondent and lose trust in you and your assertion that you want them to be involved. So set those parameters from, from, the, from the start. Anticipate anxieties and how you will respond to them. So, uh, you know, understand that we thrive on routine and predictability and with the change to routine comes uncertainty and for some people, not for everybody, but for some people, uh, uncertainty can translate into anxiety. So, uh, think long and hard about the, the personalities you have on your team and about how some people might respond and the specific uh, issues and anxieties they might have. And then think about how you're going to um, allay their fears, what you're going to do, and sit down and communicate this to them from the start. Maybe even one to one rather than the, the group meeting. Okay, this is pretty obvious. Needless to say, don't over prepare with a big presentation. Leave lots of space for uh, discussion and dialogue and debate. And as I said earlier, for, for their input. Um, them to express themselves. And uh, finally, um, start each meeting with the tea and biscuits, <laughs> <laughs> at the very least, or indeed a box of quality street. <laughs> <laughs>